गुरु साक्षात पर and welcome back so hopefully all of this is kind of like making sense so far let's let's review there are four vedas now if you need another analogy you could maybe think of these four vedas as being four large bookcases in a library uh, the rug veda has the hymns to the gods the sama veda has the old songs that you sing during the soma sacrifices the Yajur Veda has the liturgical formulae that you mutter while you're performing the rites. And the Atharva Veda is a set of magic formulas. If you're a Vedic priest, you get to be trained in one of these four bookcases. And you're expected to memorize the whole bookcase, the whole Veda, and use it live during a ritual. Uh, while other priests who have memorized in that one of the other bookcases memorize, uh, recite their Veda. Now, here's where it gets a little bit complicated. Each Veda has four different types of texts within it. So each bookcase you can think of has four different shelves, maybe. Uh, and each Veda has the same four divisions or layers. The first layer of, Veda, of the Veda is called the Samhitas. These are kind of like the core or base of each Veda. This is the actual sacred utterances or mantras that are going to get chanted or sung or muttered in each of in, during the ritual, like a book of lyrics. Maybe each Veda has its own core samhita, and it's the first thing that students are taught to to learn by heart, starting at the age of six or eight. Everyone in Vedic school has to learn their samhita. Mistakes in pronunciation are not tolerated, and uh, because the idea is that if you make er any error at all, any mistake at all when reciting the mantra the whole ritual will collapse. Uh, and it could actually it'd be even worse. It could have a harmful effect rather than a positive one. The second layer of texts in each Veda is called the Brahmana texts. Now, I know it's a little confusing because this word Brahmana, but it's different from the Brahman with a little b, which is the force that animates the Vedic sacrifice. Then there's the Brahmans with a big b, who are the Vedic priests. These Brahmana texts with an extra A at the end, you can think of as being instruction manuals for how to use those first set of books, the Sanghitas. Now that you've memorized the mantras, the Brahmanas are going to tell you how to use each of them in a Vedic ritual. They're also going to tell you stories and facts that explain the history and context of the mantras. And they also offer some deeper explanations of the mantras and how they work. These books are perhaps the most important as far as a Vedic education is concerned because they contain all the details that an expert would need to know and again know by heart. Like the Samhitas, you're supposed to memorize the Brahmanas as well. The third kind of Vedic texts are called the Aranyakas or the forest books. They're regarded basically as appendices to the second layer to the Brahmanas. They're like add-ons to them. Uh, and they're supposed to be taught and recited outside of the settled village or town. You're not supposed to recite them or learn them in, in town. And that's why they get their name, the forest books. Uh, there are relatively few uh, Aranyakas, but generally they provide explanations for more cryptic or secret rituals, dangerous rituals that might have involve some physical danger to the priests who are doing these rituals. Uh, you can think of them as kind of like advanced level training in Vedic ritual practice, maybe. Now, the fourth kind of Veda is really something special. We'll spend a bit of time on this. These are called the Upanishads. Uh, and these are the earliest texts of sustained speculative philosophy in India. The main task of the Upanishads is to investigate the true meaning behind this whole Vedic sacrificial culture. What is this thing called Brahman? What does that power equate to? What's the point of acquiring Brahman? Can you use it to overcome death? These are, these are the topics uh, that these texts discuss. And this is where, if really for the first time in India, a kind of sophisticated theorization of karma and rebirth starts to appear. Uh, and, and you also get a kind of thoroughgoing philosophical treatment of the self, the inner self or soul. The Upanishads are the first place where these kind of ideas get kicked around in Indian thought in any great detail. And they're so central to Hindu philosophy that actually new Upanishads get 
keep getting found throughout history, even up to the 17th century. Now, keep in mind that this whole library, as far as the Hindu tradition is concerned, is not thought to be man-made. It's all Shruti. It's always thought to have existed even from before the start of creation. Now, if we're being historians for a minute and not believers, it might be kind of hard for us to accept this kind of unhistoricality, right? So from a historical perspective, uh, scholars like to say that the Rigveda Samhita was consolidated first around 1000 BC. The other Samhitas then shortly were compiled a bit afterwards, about 900 BC. From 900 to 500 in kind of various orders, the Brahmanas, Aranyakas, and Upanishads roughly in that sequence started to get composed. Eventually, the whole Vedic library looks a bit like this image you see here. Each Veda has a basic core Samhita, a collection of utterances that everyone has to learn. The Yajur Veda has two, three Samhitas, two black Samhitas, one white Samhita. Uh, there are some cases where Vedas have two Brahmanas or two or more Upanishads. The Aranyakas, you notice, are very rare. All of these taken together constitute the Veda. And again, while historians uh, think of them as having kind of grown and developed from 1500 to 500 BC, in the Hindu tradition, they're thought to be authorless, timeless scriptures. They always existed. They are Shruti. Now, if that's Shruti, what's Smriti? Well, basically anything else, right? Anything that else that's been composed by humans. Now, I just want to take a quick look at the first man-made Vedic texts before we kind of call it a day. There's a type of text called the sutras that proved to be very important, not just for the Vedas, but actually a model for just about every other intellectual or scientific tradition that would come out of India afterwards. Uh, the sutras are highly condensed, aphoristic professional manuals that, that quickly and effectively tell you just the facts that you need to know to perform a specific ritual. Uh, they include like bits and bobs of the Samhita, the Brahmanas of each Veda. They, they throw in a little chunk of the Upanishads every now and then as well. They, get, uh, they also gave you some more info on how to use the mantras in a more general context, not just in rituals, but in the kind of in the real world, in like day-to-day, -day, everyday life. Uh, these begin to be written around 500 BC. And like I said, they're give, considered to have had human authors. And uh, sutras came in two kinds. There's Shrauta Sutras, which are for public large-scale sacrifices, and Gruhya Sutras, which were manuals for domestic rites. We'll be talking about these a little bit more later on in, in another unit. Uh, for now, it's best to keep in mind that Gruhya Sutras end up being the ones that still have relevance today in Hinduism, especially for two uh, situations. One, for performing marriage rites, uh, two for the thread ceremony that Brahmin adolescent boys undergo, and actually also for funerals as well. Okay, so hopefully this in-depth excursion into the ins and outs of Vedic literature has given you kind of a good sense, decent sense maybe, of what we mean when we say the Vedas or the Vedic texts. Uh, we're going to take this knowledge with us, uh, and in our last segment, uh, we'll look at the fascinating and really kind of remarkable ways in which this knowledge has been preserved and passed down from person to person orally without writing uh, for thousands of years.